show it kicked off. Hey, welcome one and all to the Australia Microsoft 365 Adoption User Group for June. We are kicking in and getting ourselves started for another big month of, you know, what's going on in 365. There's always plenty. The link to the presentation is actually available for you. I have pinned it in chat so you'll be able to get to it. So you can always see up the top the pin. You'll be able to come back to that a little later. At the very end of the session, over the next week or so, I will put the recording live up on on YouTube, you won't be able to click on the link inside our chat, but I will make sure that it's available. You can go to the YouTube channel, which is just the aka.ms slash M365 adoption. You can actually subscribe and then you'll get the notification of once that recording has gone live as well to be able to help and support you in your journey to adoption. Right. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land in which we're meeting from today and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and I extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders peoples here today. Code of Conduct, I ask that we be welcoming and opening open to all questions and viewpoints because we have a lot of people that come into these sessions. So um, there's certainly always uh, plenty of information flying around. I ask that we be kind and understanding of all of our differences and that we're patient and we're friendly and that we use appropriate gifts and have some consideration for others in chat as well. Okay, All things that are all very important for us as part of Bangin. If you haven't been in before, my name is Kirsty McGraw. I am an adoption consultant. My company is On Point Solutions. Um, I have been running the user groups now for well over eight years and still still going. I was like, ah, still going. <laughs> now, what have I been up to? It was my grandson's seventh birthday. So in about an hour, I threw together a mm. um, Pokemon cake and not only Pokemon cake, but a Pokemon cake. And he was, he was, he's kind of got a little over Minecraft, but he's still into Minecraft. Minecraft, so I blew up Minecraft basically by <laughs> setting it on fire. So we had a lot of we had a lot of fun at his birthday party, but it was a huge month. I did a uh, quite a few you know comedy things. I went to Dawn French and Stephen K Amos. I went to Brisbane. For my aunt's 80th birthday, that's a photo of me with my mommy, and I made 36 cupcakes that I put into a great big figure 80 at the party. So I had some fun up in Brisbane. I have run two cupcake classes. You know, I do my walking on a Sunday morning. So what we did instead was we went out there and I brought them all to my place and we just did a heap of cupcakes and uh, I have a whole new appreciation for those that run training and <laughs> in the <laughs> in the caking space uh, so I certainly learned an awful lot and they learned how patient I am as a trainer so and that was always a, a fun piece I have had four speaking engagements over the last month that has been a it has I said it's been a big month I presented at the um, the co-pilot user group. I did co-pilot in the fast lane at the master master um, uh, 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 mastermind. They call it co-pilot mastermind at the reactor. I also spoke at the Brisbane user group. I've spoken with the Adelaide user group. Um, the Adelaide Copilot user group as well. And I also went and spoke at the Loretta Curability Girls School in regards to STEM and understanding what it looks like to be in the STEM space. And our focus was around a little bit more on the cybersecurity because we're just not seeing enough, enough young ladies joining that space. So it was quite a fascinating um, session. So we've had lots going on. And because I have been away and on the go and, <laughs> and running around so much, my poor pussycat decided that she'd sit on me to try and maybe pin me down. <laughs> She's missed me. So, you know, anything she can do to try and make sure that I'm not going anywhere. So, you know, I lost her. <laughs> so we had a bit of fun. So that's what I have been up to over the last month or so. Matt, I am very excited to have our guest speakers. Should be an S on the end because it's not just one speaker this month. We have a few speakers coming in, so I'm rather excited to have the Swoop team coming in and having a chat. So we've got Sharon, Emily, Dr. Lawrence, luckily, and Matt joining us to have a have a bit of a 
an understanding and an insight around you know how people are actually using um, intranets and accessing intranet, company intranet. So you know we want to look at what those achievable goals are and the benchmarks that we need to try and get our colleagues actually reading, engaging on your internet. But I'm going to let them really dive into it and take over presenting so that they can give us a little bit of an idea. So welcome, guys. Uh, lovely as always having you come in and have a, have a chat with us about your latest research. Thank you so much, Kirsty. Thanks for hosting us today. I really appreciate it. Emily's already on the money. She's going to share the slides with us. So welcome everyone to our session. It's on how to manage a successful intranet. So as Kirsty said, we're going to take a look at the key insights from our 2024 internet benchmarking report, which we published about a week ago. So this benchmarking data, it gives real life insights into how people are really using the intranet. So all our data is based off real life behaviours. We can see when people are reading, what they're reading and for how long. And from these insights, we can help you best shape your content to get maximum engagement. So in this year's report, we analysed more than 94,000 intranet pages and the behaviours of more than 177,000 employees across 20 organisations worldwide. So that was almost triple from our inaugural SharePoint benchmarking report, which we did late last year. So interestingly, some of our initial findings from our 2023 study were reinforced with this larger sample size, but other findings significantly changed. So we'll go into those in a moment. But first off, I'd also like to do an acknowledgement of country. And if you can just share, change the slide. So I acknowledge that I'm hosting this webinar from the lands of the Narrago people. That's in the New South Wales Snowy Mountains for me. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all work today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this webinar. I pay my respects to Eldon's elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of Australia. I'd also like to introduce you to the rest of the SWOOP team, which I think Kirsty's pretty much already done. But Dr. Lawrence Lockley is our Chief Scientist and Matt Dodd is our Product Director. And also on the call is Emily O'Brien and Francesca, who are our um, Customer Success Managers um, for the APAC region. So if you've got any questions at all, just reach out to Fran or Emily. Um, I so wasn't realise we had Francesca. Sorry, Francesca. Yeah. Sorry, that was, yeah. that was one that wasn't on my, that wasn't on my list. So welcome. <laughs> uh, Fran is always a ray of sunshine. So she's excellent to have on board. So we'd really like to make this session interactive. But um, Kirsty will tell you, we had some problems trying to get the polls up and running. So um, we might just ask a few, a couple of questions throughout and we'll just get you to put answers in the chat. Um, and also, please go ahead and ask any questions in the chat throughout the session. So Keep an eye on that and it would probably it'd be great um, if you've got a question about a particular finding that Laurie's talking about, pop the question in straight away and we'll try and answer it then before we move on to the next one. So I'm going to hand over to Laurie now to take you through the key insights. Okay, thanks Sharon. So um, as Sharon mentioned, you know, this was a bigger sample than last year, 20 organisations, probably still not enough to do some industry analysis, but there's a heap of pages, a heap of users, uh, so lots of sites and so forth, so plenty of data to work with. Uh, those of you that aren't familiar with, with the style of benchmarking we do at Swoop Analytics, sort of, uh, we do look at these, other than knowing the names of the organisations, that's about it. We, we uh, only use uh, anonymous IDs for people and for, for departments and so forth. Uh, but that's not like, that, that doesn't mean that we don't have any context. What we do do is that when we find some uh, outstanding sort of performances from our anonymous sort of analysis, we then sort of start to go and, and, and interview our, um, our providers or the people that are particip our participants. And, uh, and they often will provide us with the context and some stories and some, some uh, well, very interesting sort of qualitative sort of uh, feedback. Sometimes we get to, to publish those as case studies. But uh, if we don't, we certainly benefit from those interviews and we, we include those in the report. So the report isn't just just numbers. There's certainly numbers there, but there's there's also stories and context in there as well. So uh, let's move on, Emily. Next slide. Uh, okay. So uh, I'm just a little bit delayed and I can see the next slide. Sorry, so 
Okay. Just trust. No, that's fine. I'm that's hitting fine. that slide for you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so basically, when we look sorry, at those 20 sorry organizations. Sorry to interrupt you guys. Oh. I can actually put the polls in. It's oh. allowing me now. Maybe they finally fixed it. I've been putting it out. So the I just time. double checked. I've managed to put the first one up. So I'm not sure when you need them all, but I can type them all in well, for we you. Can, we can. We can do it yeah. now if you want. Do you want to do it now, Sharon? Or while yeah, it's sure. So th this is the first question we were going to ask you. And this is just to get you thinking about the data and how our findings compare with what it looks like on your own intranet. So take a punt and what percentage of employees access your intranet? So the finding we're going to share with you is what we found as, is the, as the average over the 20 organisations. But it'd be really interesting just to see, you know, what it, how the, how that stacks up against your own internet. Over a, so over a three month period though. Over a three so. month period, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you want so me, we got. Do you want me to put them all through? You know, do you want to give me a timing? So we'll just have to type them all in and things along the way. How oh. do you want me to wait on them? Yeah, just so that I know. Wait, wait for the next ones just for a couple of slides, Kirsty. Okay. That'd be wonderful. Sure. Thank you. So this is interesting. So the majority here, we've got um, forty three percent of people are saying around forty six percent. So around that half. Uh, halfway and have a look at those final results there. So Laurie, do you want to, because there's quite a few results coming in there and the standout one, the most popular is the 46% or the 58%. Do you want to go through and look at what we found in the benchmarking? Um, well, that's probably on the next slide, but okay. uh, now I've mixed up, but I'll get to that. Let me just sort of work <laughs> through this one first. This is really just to give you a bit of a sense of what people are using their internet for. So we've got the 20 organisations and we're basically just plotting uh, news pages and content pages. So remember, internet started as just content and then news came along. And then, in fact, news is often used as, as a way of engaging with, with the readers, whereas content is typically there for reading. But as you can see, there's, there's quite a variety of both sizes in terms of pages and the proportion of news versus content. So I think, we're, and this is SharePoint Online, remember, so it's it's still relatively new. So I guess what we can take from this is that, you know, there's still a, a, a large variability of how people are actually using SharePoint Online as, a, as an intranet, especially in the mix of news to content. Okay, let's move on and see if we get to the uh, usage, Emily. All right, so this is this is the poll which we ran. Okay, so eighty six percent over the three month period. So certainly bigger than what people were thinking on the poll. But my sense is that some of you on the poll were probably thinking per day. Uh, but this is over a three month period. That number is pretty good, actually. If you think about that, you know, people do go to the the intranet for content and always have, and I think that part is working quite well. Uh, in terms of people that go to the intranet for news, that number's around 60%. So it drops drops back for news. Um, unfortunately, news is the thing that tends to engage people in two-way communication. So it's certainly something that we'd, we'd want to be higher. But I can say in terms of the base use of an intranet is where you go to for enterprise information, that seems to be working quite well. Yeah. So... The what what's also interesting about this one is 86% of employees seems like a big number to me like you know you could look at that and go well is my job done because i've got most of most employees are actually using the internet but the probably the key takeaway from the whole benchmarking report is that while people visit the internet they don't stay long so they have a time budget and we'll discuss that a little bit later on so it's really important to showcase the news and the content you need colleagues to see so you can make the most out of that short visit go on to the next slide emily is this a poll I'm just trying to think. No, this is. No. It's not moving yet. Oh, here oh, we here go. We go. <laughs> How many people oh, okay. are accessing? So we already went through this then, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so we can move to the next so, one. So then. just on this one, though, the we did, as Laurie said, we did lots of interviews um, with most of the 20 organisations that we benchmarked. So some of them have got case studies in the report. but. As Laurie said, we just learn so much from talking with people who are managing intranets. So one of the keys were um, 
the key ways, a tip to get employees visiting the intranet is uh, if you send all company emails or newsletters that are wrapping up news or information, just share the teasers in the email and then link those to the full story on your intranet. So people have to follow that link to get onto the intranet. So the teasers will sort of peak interest and it, encur it will encourage people who'd otherwise rely on email. So this was especially effective if there's something that will result in a benefit for employees. So it's think about it that what's in it for me approach. So it could be things like, you know, exclusive employee benefits or a competition or a message from their direct leader, those type of things. We're just going to move on to Matt now, going to jump in and he'll show you how you can find out who accesses your own intranet. Yeah, so we have a whole range of stats on our dashboard and we, we have a essentials dashboard, which is basically to summarise all the kind of key stats that you're getting at a, an intranet level. So you can see here, you've got the number of unique visitors, how often they come, so the daily number that, that we repeat, because obviously all the stats that we're giving at the moment are over a, a sort of three month um, period. So we want to be able to show people what that kind of daily average is. And then in that bottom right hand side under the activity under time is a little percentage. And that is actually the percentage of people that are accessing uh, your intranet over that uh, month period, pretty much based on all the accounts um, that are available that people have in, in their M365 tenant. So really quick and easy way to sort of see what that percentage is. Excellent. Kirsty, can you get that next poll ready if sure. you've got time? I've got yeah, it. I've got it here. Awesome. Yep. Let so me this, send it through. Thank you. This one we're going to ask, how much time do employees spend on the internet each day? So just take a guess. So we're going to give you the answers as the average from the 20 organisations and the nearly 200,000 employees, but it'd be interesting to see what you think it is at your organisation. So we've got some results coming in. Most people about seven minutes. That's looking good. Well, the majority, or the answers are still coming in, but the majority have sort of got it right and sort of not depending whether we use average or median time. So I'm going to hand <laughs> over to Laurie. Yeah, we, we have this continuing debate if you just around. With, second with the slides, sorry. Oh, no, you're right. Well, you keep oh, talking though, Laurie. Sorry, yet, I just am going yeah. to reshare, sorry. All right, so that's okay. But, I mean, we have this interesting internal discussion about do people understand median rather than average? And um, I keep saying, well, if you deal in real estate, you'll understand what median means because the top end can bias the averages. And it's the same in your digital workplaces. You know, there are people that can actually live on the internet and, and make the averages go up. It turns out that the median is around seven minutes, right? But the average is about 16 minutes, right? So, so, and that's been influenced by people that must just sit on the internet all day, if you like. So, so if you like, the average is around 16 minutes, but the median, I think, came in around seven or eight minutes. Now, the, uh, the sad part about the news is that of that 16 minutes, about one minute is spent reading news. And if we go to the median, I think it was about 18 seconds or something like that. So so when Sharon talked about uh, the challenge of, of, of gaining attention, you know, if we do use what I think is the most appropriate measure, the median, you have 18 seconds to get people's attention to news. And, and you've got about seven minutes, a lot more, to for attention to content. So... Um, uh, I think we have those on the slide somewhere here, Emily, but it hasn't got to that yet. I think we're looking at the front yeah. page. Yeah, so but, really uh, the, the challenge is... Know, I'm so... That's okay, Laura. The challenge really... I'm so sorry. I, I, I... It's sorry, there, Emily, Emily, you go, you one. go. It's getting there. My, I'm so sorry. I had I had one shot today and I'm failing at this. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just trying to slowly make my way through the slides. Are they at least moving now? Yes, they're coming through yeah. now. So just a few yes. more. So, so just back to what we were saying, like the challenge okay. for those managing intranets um, 
is really to tailor the content to fit that, you know, one sec, one 18 seconds for news or one minute, depending on whether you're using median or average times. Um, and so tailor that content to fit the brief time employees are willing to commit to reading the intranet. So for maximum impact, think about what messages you'd like to prioritise for that small window of attention that's available. This is the slide that Laurie was just talking mm -hmm. to. So you can see there, one minute for average um, time spent reading news per day, 15 minutes for content pages, but then the median times was 18 seconds for news and seven minutes for content pages. Yeah, so um, good guess <laughs> in terms of median. So, ah, now, so the health score. Now, I think this is something that I, I have to credit Matt for this because he sort of, he'll talk to this in more detail, but... Uh, uh, what we what we when we first built the product for SharePoint, we did go out and asked our customers what things were missing from the analytics, and this sort of came out of that. You know, we'd like to know, you know, how healthy it is, you know, what things we need to fix and what have you. So we have in in our product an overall health score for the pages, which is broken up into quality, experience, and engagement. And the engagement, as you can see, is the lowest sort of performing one, which is really that speaks to the attention. So this is like how much time are people spending on a page against how much time they should be spending on that page to effectively consume that that uh, information. So I'm going to hand over to Matt because uh, he's he's the expert on health and uh, he'll <laughs> tell you about <laughs> how all these things are measured. Yeah, so the, 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 say we, we combine these things into an overall health score. So it's just a kind of indicator, I guess, as to how things are doing. But the, the interesting thing for me with this is we are providing really good quality and good experience, good experiences on our intranet. So the quality we score things like broken links, spelling mistakes, how out of date or not the content is, if there are missing editors for that content, that will lower the quality score. But generally you can see um, the, the, the quality of across the study was was relatively high so people are managing and governing their intranets well the experience score is a combination of things like a readability score so we use a thing called licks which looks at how long the sentences are and how long the words are within those sentences so again the, the sort of that allows us to see if the intranet is easy to read we have how long the headings are so, you know, are there nice, short, succinct headlines um, on pages? And also how many head, how many headings are there in comparison to text so that, you know, users aren't confronted with a wall of text? That would be a sort of lower score in the experience. So all of those things which are in the, I guess, in the domain of page owners or site owners is actually really quite well looked after. And as Laurie pointed out, the gap is around engagement. So with engagement, we calculate how much content is on the page, give that an estimated read time and compare that to the actual time people spend on the pages. So are they spending enough time to actually sort of read the content or are they even visiting the content at, at all? So if pages don't get any visits at all, then obviously they're going to score kind of a zero engagement score. So that that factors into this lower engagement. You know, we have lots of content that people don't necessarily go and visit. And if they do visit, their their time is, is limited. So that's what kind of brings that down. It may need that it talks to that idea of, you know, we need that further promotion. We might need those links, as Sharon's already mentioned in the newsletters, those sorts of things to to help build that engagement up. But that's a quick summary of the health score. Perfect. So, Kirsty, can you launch that next poll, please? This is a pretty easy one. Or just put it in yeah. the chat. There you go. No, it's done. Oh, so look how good she is. interesting so what's the best day to publish news on the internet looks like people have been reading their report it's interesting some people have had said sunday we were speaking with one um la oh actually it was comcast um which is like the biggest media giant in the us and they said they send those 
emails on a Sunday night so that people either read them before they start work on a Sunday night or first thing Monday morning. But people have got the got the right day in the poll. It's actually Tuesday was the most popular, but it's only marginally different yeah, on any weekday. Slide. Yeah, okay. yeah. Basically Tuesday okay. wins, but not by much actually. So uh, so in essence, uh, we can probably go to the data slides, Emily, so we can um yeah, so we've got the day, time of day, and oh, and, uh, yeah, okay. So, so this is pretty much one of the reinforcing thing, things from last year's study. So you get the, the twin peaks as just as people come into work, and then after people had a break in the middle of the day, tends to be the the peak reading times. And uh, if we go to the next one, next click. Uh, the days of the week, as you said, Tuesday wins, but not by much, really. In fact, I think I think if you publish on any of those days from Monday to Thursday, you're going to do pretty well. And um, uh, so, yeah, and this is pretty much mimicked in from last year's data as well. So, uh, but I, I guess the sense is the earlier in the week, the better. But um, but in essence, any of those first four days are fine. And that's something that we measure. Um again in our dashboards we have that activity by time so if you do exhibit that difference uh, you can go in and check the activity over time on on our reports so yeah it's, really, a, important it's a really point, nice one to be able to check and actually really useful for yeah. your scheduling and those sorts of things so yeah, yeah. very handy yeah, it's an, an important point i guess i'm talking to about averages here and of course we do find individual companies that have different sorts of contexts where that pattern is quite different, you know, depending on what, what sort of business they are. So it is important to look at your particular situation. Yeah. Okay. Is there an optimal length? This was something that was was uh, people were interested in last year and as well as this year. Uh, whilst we've got a number 300 to 600 words, there's a lot of writers on that. that probably is a good range in terms of how big they are, but let's go to the data because that tells us a little bit more. So what we've got plotted here in the red bars, it's the top 10% of news articles for each organisation. How long were they? And you can see, if you look at the red bars, they vary from 250 for one organisation up to 750 for the other ones. And then the, the grey bars are the, the content you know, rather than the news. So. Um, now we did interview the the one at the the far left, which has has long news articles. We did actually interview them, and they have a very news centric sort of use of their internet. And uh, Sharon, I guess you can point talk anonymously, I guess, to the yeah. to their particular case. And it wasn't just this organisation that had this same similarity. It's about human interest stories. So they were saying that whenever there's human interest stories, we had this from multiple um, organisations we spoke to, and especially those that are about colleagues or people that's, that they might know or they've heard about in the organisation, they're the ones that see, receive the most engagement as news stories. And it was regardless of their length. Like often we were told 1,500 words, no problem. They were still the most engaged engaging stories on the internet but when it comes to corporate messaging short and sweet is best i think so so the only yeah. other real pattern from this was that 13 of the 15 you know the, the the most popular news articles were actually longer than the average right so there was only uh, so the gray bars tended to be lower than the red bars but other than that you know sort of if you can take away I think the main thing you can take away is what Sharon just sort of went through in terms of building engagement around news. Okay, and less can be more. This was this was another uh, hypothesis that that Matt, our internet expert, sort of posed to me is that you know, he felt when he was working at Bank West that you know even if you put more stuff out there, people don't seem to read more. You know, so I thought, well, we can explore that. And in fact, uh, what we found was actually that was actually the case that in fact. Putting more news out there doesn't mean people read more news and read longer. In fact, we we came to the conclusion that people have a, a a reading time budget for news, and if you put more news out there, they just scan it even more, or just miss a few, or what have you. So, uh, so it is really uh, yeah, less is more, which means that you know you've really got to be skilled at how you write news to get that attention span of eighteen seconds. You know, if you want to engage people. You know, this is where it becomes very important to be able to write your content in a way that it can engage. So, um, 
So again, it comes comes back to that whole: how do you get that attention, especially with news? And and as I said, news is related to what we call engagement. So when we talk about employee engagement, we we talk about two way interactions. So we're less interested in in just readership, but more in terms of whether people are actually uh, engaging in two way conversations around around content. Yeah, and it's it's a report that again in our essentials we give people the summary of all the the sort of top news items in the in the in the product. Really simple to get hold of, but it, it, yeah, it absolutely just showed um, the the news. You know, if you've got internal comms teams that get um, quotas, I've, I've certainly worked in those teams where people's <laughs> targets were right. You know, each person had to write so many news items. It's kind of defeating the object. It's definitely a case of pick what you want to put news on. And I guess from an adoption point of view, this whole idea that I'm sure lots of people on this call will have heard that, oh, well, we're just comms it. The idea that you just publish the news and it's the job is done is really not going to be the case. So, um, yeah, a really interesting point. And I think it also tied in that actually we found out it was only generally one news story a week that people did actually read. So, um, yeah, not not the best um, if you are wanting to just flood intranets with news. What devices do people use? Again, this is a, a bit of a, a controversial finding from last year, but in fact was reinforced this year, is how do people access the internet in terms of what devices? And it's it's the desktop, right? 98.3, it might have gone down from 99 something last year. Uh, we won't dwell on this too much because if you think that there's, uh, you, you don't believe this result, have a look at our last year's report because we actually went to four internet experts to to try and validate this finding. Uh, three of them validated it. The other one thought that we probably didn't have the right sample, and we we only had seven organisations. But this time we've got twenty, and you know it's still staying there. So it looks like that at least at this point in time, you know the mobile isn't having a big impact on on reading on the internet. Yeah, and, and just, our devices, we pick up the um, the user agent and the device type. So we measure both device type and the sort of browser that people are, are looking at. Um, again, really easy to be able to look at this, not only by the whole of the intranet, but you can actually look at things like departments and see if particular departments have that variability. So if you've got some frontline departments, you might find that slightly higher uplift in uh, mobile adoption. Um, and I think the question for me when I think about it as a sort of ex internet manager with mobile isn't isn't a case of um, are we going to get high mobile adoption? It's probably more a case of we should set that as a an ambition and an openness. You know, we want our information to be open. So having mobile is almost like a a statement of intent, even if it's not actually that high um, adoption in reality. I'm just going to jump in with some questions here. I'll start yeah. with Craig's because he's going to he's asking this question about do we have stats on customers who have the internet set as their browser homepage? We do in a nutshell, Craig. I'll hand over to Laurie. But we think in this 98%, I think we filtered out most of those people. Can you explain, please, Laurie? Yeah, well, I guess that that's true. Some organisations, you you know, if you if you open your browser, you get the internet by default. You know, so we try and exclude those because it does bias the sort of uh, the, the 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 stats a bit. So um, uh, it's as so I said, we, it, it is certainly something we do see. And we didn't include people who were on the internet for less than a second. That was it, wasn't it, Laurie? Well, we do we do measure that. We do measure that that pages where people uh, we call them zero time visits because you know whether they've gone there by accident or, or not. There is a fair bit. You know, there's something like seven or eight percent of the of the pages uh, have visits that uh, you know for less than a second. You know, so that's a mis that's either a mistake or some glitch in the system or what have you. But uh, uh, but we do report on that in 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 the report. It's. It, it's there, but I, we don't think it has a huge impact on engagement, but it might have an impact on search because, you know, they'll still come up that in, in the search results. So um, even though people really haven't spent enough time to even do anything with it, so uh, it's something to be mindful of at least. And we talk Alice, about that in the report. 
Yep. Yeah, Alison asks uh, a question here. And Alison, I'll share a blog post I did a few months ago on this. But we have a 99% usage from desktop, but our intranet isn't responsive. Do you find that if organisations' intranets are, des are designed better to be responsive, there's a much more mobile usage? Really interesting question. Yeah, yeah. Well, we can't really answer that. I don't know if Matt's got a comment on that, but... Um... No. Not not from the stats. The stats are showing that it doesn't happen. But um, again, I think it is it is about the intent. Um, there is that question, and I know Kirsty, you put the comment in there about the sort of SharePoint app on mobile phones, and that we we have all of these access points. But again, it's what are, it's the context of what people are trying to do. Whenever I've thought about the digital workplace, you know, the environment that someone's working in, the context that they're working in, I think is really important. Um, and if if someone's so time pressured that the only way that they're going to view any information is on their on their mobile device they're probably pretty focused on the thing that they need right at that moment in time rather than being able to sort of sit and browse um, and we do have some information that d does reference um viva engage which i won't delve into because we'll get to that in a in a yeah. moment but we did have last um, year we did, did have one of our um participants said that they actually purposely focused on mobile users because they had frontline staff and um, and so I'm assuming they had all the responsive interfaces and anything that they could do because they're quite quite a large organization with many resource lots of resources and um, they said they got the number up to about eight or nine percent you know so it's not like it blows it away it doesn't turn the turn the whole thing upside down so it, it just means it's a, it's a bigger proportion but still still not not hugely significant. Okay, uh, this was this was probably my favourite part of the analysis. Well, not you know, one of the more favourite parts of my analysis because because uh, it's sort of like um, uh, do people that go to the intranet also use Viva Engage or or are on Teams or uh, use email or what have you? So what I did here is I, I looked at and this is this speaks to this sort of whole multi-channel omni-channel analysis for internal communications people so if we think about people that that live in their email people that use viva engage people that are on the internet of course that we're we're focusing on now and also people that go to meetings so what i did was we had some data a subset of this group uh, and there was a reason our data on on people that uh, people's habits in terms of email sharepoint of course viva engage and meetings especially attending meetings and what we've and what i did was i correlated those two lists so if you think about um, uh, if you had a list of the most active people on email in reading and writing the most active people on beaver engage reading and writing uh, the most active people reading the internet and the most uh, active people in terms of attending meetings and you've got those lists and you correlate them together to see how much of an overlap uh, they are on those lists what we do find is that there's a big overlap between internet readers and Viva Engage users, both readers and writers. And there's a still significant, but not as strong overlap between people that read on the internet and people that attend meetings. Uh, in terms of the overlap between people that read on the internet and people that live in their email, there was no significant correlation. We had one organization that did have a uh, a correlation um, but they do say that they they pretty much everybody lives in their email if you like but but for the other organizations we looked at there was there was none so what we can take away from that is that that people reading on the internet want to discuss things in Viva Engage now if you think about external news if you think about news in particular you know, if you're reading digital news, you know, there's often not a huge discussion at the end of the digital news thing, and often there's none. Uh, but people will discuss that news somewhere else, you know, whether it's on Twitter or on Facebook or wherever, Instagram, you know, it'll be somewhere else. And I think this is what's happening here too, that people see the internet as the place to read stuff, not to discuss stuff necessarily. And they do that on Viva Engage, as far as I'm concerned, you know, maybe a little bit might leak to Teams, but I think it's largely on Viva Engage. But um, so I think that I think that's a, an interesting one. That's actually so if you like, the information is socialised on Viva Engage, and that's where engagement happens. So if you're interested in employee engagement, you've got to look at these two things together.
And we've got some really good case studies in the report. There was one from Victoria Police. What they ended up doing is sharing, mostly they get their news articles from scrolling through communities on Viva Engage. Then the internal comms team might take that post and write up an intranet news story. Then they actually created um, a web part where it brings in the initial Viva Engage conversation where they got that story from. So that will be on the intranet. So you're effectively able to comment or apply to the internet news story via Viva Engage, but on the internet. Um, and there was another organisation, which is a global one based, headquartered out of um, the UK, and they had replaced their internet news feed with the Viva Engage all company feed. So they really wanted to democratise news, allow everyone to have their voice and everyone to be able to comment. So there's some really nice examples in the mm. report. And some turned off their the commenting on on SharePoint, so that mm. all the discussion was concentrated on Viva Engage in one place, rather than diluting the conversation across two platforms. So the interesting sort of habits that we found out about. Okay, what do we got next? Your your love. Oh, my my favourite topic. <laughs> <laughs> not mine. <laughs> yeah, no, I have to promise that not to go overboard here. I mean, I have to admit that uh, in my junior days, I was an AI researcher, and um, so I'm quite excited by all the stuff here. But what I'll concentrate on on in this point, AI can do lots of stuff, right? But the stuff it can do, pretty much right now, and anybody can use that, is to help you write succinctly. So. If one message has come out of this talk, it's that, you know, grabbing that attention is important and, and to be able to write succinctly such that you can grab that attention is a very, very uh, fine-tuned skill task. You know, those of you that remember the Mark Twain sort of quote that, you know, I'm sorry I had to write a long letter because I didn't have enough time to write a short letter. This is what this is all about, right? So, and AI can help with that, you know? So if you've got this thing that you want to write, but you want to condense it and you want to make it concise, you know, this is what AI can start to help you do even today. So uh, I won't go any further. There's lots of other things it can do as well. Uh, and I'm certainly working on that now, but um, let's leave it at that. So this is just a, a bit of a wrap up um, of the key findings. So yeah, 98% of him, oh, it's not 98%, 86%, isn't it? We've got that number wrong. No, that's by the desktop. That's the Oh, via the, the desktop. desktop. Sorry, I should yes. read it first. Yes. yes, 16 minutes a day spent on the internet on average. 86% of employees visit the internet. So the peak usage times, which Laurie went into, so it's sort of mornings when people first come into work or start working, um, and then around lunchtime and after lunch, and Tuesdays was the most popular day. 300 to 600 words was the ideal content length for news articles, but those human interest stories, 1,500 words seemed to be no problem. Um, and how employees spend time on the internet. So it's about a minute a day reading news and one article of news is read per week. So keep that one in mind. So this is all really about targeting your messaging. And we just wanted to finish up by giving you the link to download the report so you can scan that or Fran very kindly has shared the URL in the chat message there. And the other thing um, we'd love for you to do is if you want to find out what all this data looks like in your own organisation on your own internet, please join our benchmarking. You've got until March 1 next year um, to be part of our 2025 SharePoint internet benchmarking and just know that everything is anonymous unless you give us permission uh, to name you or do a case study. But it's all anonymous and part of the benchmarking is Laurie will provide you with a custom report, um, which can be just really helpful for you to be able to shape your content. And of course, that is free because you do a free trial of Swoop to be part of the benchmarking. And of course, we've got our Viva Engage benchmarking coming up. So we do hundreds of organisations as part of our Viva Engage benchmarking and we'd love you to join if you're using Viva Engage as well. So we're cutting off that um, inclusion by August 1, 2024. If you were interested in joining, Fran or Emily would love to help you um, get set up to be part of our Viva Engage benchmarking. And Kirsty, we are smack bang on time. How good are we? <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> 
Love it. I never am, so I never push anyone else to be. So <laughs> you think, you know, it's because I'm short. It takes me a lot longer to get there. <laughs> Thank you, guys. You know, I, I do love to see, you know, what's come out of your reports. I find it fascinating and I look forward to November or so when we potentially do the next one around Viva Engage and what you've actually seen come up there. Um, and thank you so much for coming in and giving us your time. I uh, oh, I do I do love it, and thank you for answering questions. If anyone's got any questions that they actually have, um, please feel free to you know type them into chat, and the you know the few of the team will still be around here to be able to answer any questions whilst we uh, get stuck into. The what's new, okay? And I put, see, I've got Francesca in there. <laughs> <laughs> I did that. I did that. Cool. No, just, just a quick one to make sure that she was on the on the team. So, okay, right. Let's get in and start to have a look around what's new in adoption. Okay, we'll just make sure that we've got everyone in here. It's just all on mute, and we'll just adjust over spotlights. Okay. Thank you all. Right. Okay. My infographic, the wheel. I'm always happy to have feedback. I'm looking at actually pulling out, considering there's a few things going on and I'm going to potentially drop off Sway, drop off Delve now and, and sort of get them off and have a look at the way that I can maybe articulate the Viva Suite a little differently and potentially bring the little icon against the apps that it's, you know, kind of included in Mm, no, any any feedback or anything that anyone thinks they might like to see a little differently. Now's the time, so I'm going to get stuck into it all over again. I know. Iteration number 41. <laughs> There's always something happening. Um, of course, everything will actually go live on the YouTube channel, so the recording will actually go up there, same as last month. It is available. Um, there's now 158 videos answering questions for the community, so if you've ever got a question, you can always even put it into um, send it in a private message, and I will get on to our global team to answer questions for you as you need it. So the presentation that I actually did for the Copilot um, co Studio Mastermind was actually doing Copilot in the fast lane. So it was all things Copilot adoption. I know I haven't actually done it for my own user group. And I kind of, I was very conscious of that after having done, you know, three or four, I should say four presentations now on this. So if you do want me to present and actually have this, please feel free to type in chat or, you know, maybe I should be doing a poll going, would you like me to actually run this in my <laughs> my own user group? Hey, here we go. Poll. Let me just drop it in. Uh, I'll just go poll, adding, and do you want me? Because you can always just watch the recording and present and co-pilot in the fast lane. Let me put it in here. Um, yes, no, maybe preview. And let me send that through. So you can actually do a bit of a vote on it. Because if it's something that you'd like to do, I'm happy to, to do it. Okay. So the, the recording is actually here. You can go watch it. Champions Call, the latest Champs Call is out there in the presentation. If you want to download it, it's got a bit of information around the current success kit, what's actually available around the co-pilot piece, um, all information that I've actually sort of outlined for you in, um, um, in the presentation and a few other things that I've done online. In the release notes for the adoption site, it wasn't actually as big as what it's been in previous months. I think the team has been very focused on um, Microsoft Build and as well as the M365 Community Conference, and there's there's lots of conferences going on at the moment, so I know the team is actually out there. There is a new course out there. It's called 4007, Discover How to Drive Enablement of Copilot in Your Organization. So this is a bit of a, a user experience, I suppose, course that's actually been um, pushed out there in adoption. I would highly recommend for anyone in this space that you might actually want to go and complete that. It will help you around that sort of that learning, one of the learning paths. There is the Microsoft Loop community. Now, this was a Dara Webster community group on LinkedIn, and it has been, I don't know if you would say, it's been taken over by the Loop team. And so I was kind of going, okay, you happy with that, Daryl? I gather so. 
<laughs> so they're now officially um, taken over his sort of loop group online, but he still does run the um, the sessions. So he is running sessions. So there's a lot more information that's actually being pushed out by the loop team on LinkedIn for us. There is a great new white paper that's actually come out around Copilot. There's been a few, so I'm going to talk a few, a couple of them that have gone out. Um, so what can Copilot's earliest users teach us? There is some fabulous stats. Now, this is just some of them. There is so much content in there. It's very, very rich. But I do like the fact that it actually gives us the, you know, on average, you know, how much time was actually saved. The fact that it's like 14 minutes. And, and as part of my presentation, if you want me to do it, I do put all that down to some figures and numbers and what does that mean around productivity savings and gainings and things like that. So um, there's some great stats in there, including, do you know, what are they actually doing um, and how does it actually break down in terms of some of the productive sort of creative things that they're actually doing to save themselves some time? So if we were building programs or training programs or we're wanting to put something out there, then, you know, Focusing on things like, you know, get that first draft and come in and go generating ideas. If you want to get the, you know, what are the big benefits, it gives you some of those great benefits in there. There's another one called Five New Habits, helping you to get the most out of AI in 2024. So you'll see, so we'll start to list back the five top things that are recommended. There's also the new 2024 Work Trend Index on the state of AI at work that's actually come out. I would highly recommend it going in and having a bit of a look at that and what it actually looks like. Um, there's some cool information in there, including, you know, things that you can actually do a bit of, you know, step by steps and creating and publishing and managing the prompts and the labs and what you might do there. So um, I, I do like it. The other one is AI at work is here. Now, in this one, even more stats. This one in particular, I found some real value in. There were things like 75% of knowledge workers are already actually using it. Um, one of the things that we've actually found is they're bringing some of their own tools. So even though they're, you know, at the top 5% are the heaviest, but they've summarized eight hours of meetings so this is where they then don't have to, I suppose, get in so much and do it themselves. It's automatically doing it for them. So what are the heaviest users actually doing? Um, and, you know, without some of that guidance, what we're doing is they're doing a bit of BYO. So they're doing it even though you don't know. So we want to try and look at how we can actually... I suppose, bring that into our organization and start teaching because they're already doing it. So what can we do to make sure that they're actually doing it in a safe and secure way? Where's your governance and compliance around? It's going to be really important because a lot of them are actually really reluctant to admit that they're even doing it. So then this sort of, you know, it creates a little bit of you know, worry around, well, what are they doing? How are they doing it? We don't want to lock it down. We want to try and advance it, but we've got to look at ways that we can do that in a safe and successful way. Um, as part of that case study, it's got in there that Copilot's users read 11% fewer emails and then 4% less time actually interacting with those. So, um, and the impact is it's actually saving them on some time. Same with things like documents as well. That uh, we're seeing some productivity increase and in impact. So we're starting to see information generated a lot faster from a productivity standpoint. Um, on LinkedIn, a post that uh, a sorry an article that went up on LinkedIn was that they've seen a hundred forty two percent increase globally around AI aptitude skills. So if you haven't actually updated your LinkedIn, it might be time to put in if you're using AI and you're getting in or you're teaching or you're working in it. Try and put AI in there or what type of AI that you're kind of getting involved in. Okay. There is some new advanced analytics. Oh, well, sorry, there's a blog that's come out helping you to understand how to use the advanced analytics when it comes to what's in there in Copilot. So this is quite a long PDF of all things around the dashboard to be able to help and support you um, understanding how you can actually apply it. There's also to work well with Gen um, AI, um, needing to learn how to talk to it. This was a um, a great report that's come out by one of the chief scientists. Um, I 
go go have a look. There's some great stuff. It's in the um, Harvard Business Review. Now, some of this stuff is coming through. We're seeing a lot. It is heavy on, I suppose, the AI because it's the latest trend. So we're seeing a lot of stuff coming through. So you may or may not be using it. Okay. Some of the great five habits that have actually come out of it. These were the top things that they really want to see people actually using. Okay. Now, Vivo Engage has actually got some new guides. So there's some new guides and new templates that have actually come out to be able to help and support you. Some of those is the um, Engage Round Copilot. It's actually a editable guide so that you can pull this down and you can actually have a play around of what you can actually do to use, you know, Ring Out Copilot for your communications. There are some templates that have actually flown through. One that I particularly liked. So apart from the fact that you've got an FAQ template that's editable, the thing that I liked was this passport campaign to be able to do a bit of gamification. So the passport leads you through how you build it, how you set it up, what does it look like to be able to go in and earn stickers and stamps. It gives you all the little stickers and stamps and things to be able to get your passport that you can actually download. And you could even, I suppose, post that onto LinkedIn to say that you've done it. So this is a bit of a, um, a rather cool process. This is the very last page of the presentation leading you through how do you get to this point where it looks like this. So. Do like it. The FAQs, it actually has seven pages of FAQs in regards to Viva Engage and how to be able to work. Um, great to have in there. You could just post this up on your Viva Engage. You might have it on your internet side around Viva Engage where you're putting up sort of the Q&As of how to be able to work with it. Uh, it's a good one. Don't need to invent it yourself. It's all actually there. So live from the M365 conference, there is some great content that you could actually go and watch. This one in particular with, um, is with Jeff Tepper and Jarek Snyder to kind of go through, you know, what's actually been going on. They do talk about Copilot. They talk about all sorts of things and um, best practice there in the broadcast. There are some custom backgrounds that have come out around the Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Now, that was back in uh, early May, but I do like the backgrounds. I thought they were rather pretty if anyone was interested in some of those backgrounds. There is an AMA coming up in regards to insights around what actually happened at Build. There was a lot that was pushed out in regards to Build. Now, this has actually already been and done. However, what I liked was there was some great conversation in there, questions and answers, questions by the community, answers by Microsoft and sometimes the community as well. I would recommend maybe going and have a little bit of a read. There is a very heavy focus on Copilot. There's a new page that's actually come out on the adoption side, the Microsoft community site. One I particularly like this is, it's that whole community piece. Um, don't forget there's always the Mondays at Microsoft that Caruana and Heather who presented two months ago to us in our fireside chat and um, they run that every month now in there is all of the communities and the links for the communities that you might want to go and have a look at so great sort of um, collation of all the content into one place there's also the um, um, uh, the global community initiative as well so if you're running any kind of community events on this page is the community days. So these are calls that you can actually get involved in. It's on a calendar. So we'll list them all out on a calendar if you're wanting to join. So you'll see coming up, it's got the change champion session, the community champion session available that you might want to join. It's actually got the physical invite in there so that you can go and plug in. Um, you'll also note there are things like Viva Connections and SharePoint in there, um, office add-ins, should you be dealing with it? There's lots. Okay. So that's on the adoption space. So what's coming and what's new to M365? Okay, a lot. <laughs> now, Microsoft Builds Book of News is actually available and out there. A lot of it is fairly technically focused because Microsoft Build is focused more on the technical. However, it does have some other core components that are of value that you might want to go in and have a look at. OK, so one of those ones to have a little bit of a look through, you can click on like the table of contents and there's even some assets in there that you can go and download if you need to. I, in my travels, came across some great guides. Now, these guides are for the education space, but some of them 
really aren't pitched so much. There can be quite generic in some respects. There are guides across all the various topics. Now they are, they've got ones for educators and ones for students. So in terms of some of their focus, but some of these guides are very cool. Now they're right across a ton of topics. I've just chosen a couple that I've dropped in here. And there might be ones that you would like to potentially have that you would adjust and they are PDFs, but maybe you want to do something internally and you want a bit of a design of what you might put in there. There are some good ones in there if you're building out training content. Although just kind of use Microsoft content wherever you can. Um, in Microsoft Build, you've got the 11 hours of Microsoft Build in the um, in the video. However, if you come in at around about three hours and 32, you've actually got some fabulous content there that unpacks a little bit about Copilot and um, kind of getting it from that end user perspective of what's going on or where you might have challenges or don't forget it's based on a chat GPT that's actually back in 2021 um, and there's a few little components that are really good to help you around uh, how to pitch some of this content. Okay. New out there is Copilot Plus PCs. So this is actually bought in their top OEMs, the likes of, for example, you know, if you're getting a HP, these are the what are their higher end devices that are actually available for you to be able to buy alongside Microsoft Windows and Copilot, where it's been designed very specifically to this particular technology. Now, um, it's a new way. These are spec devices to be able to help and support you on journeys. If you are looking at it for your organization, organization and you want to try and do something that's a bit AI heavy, you might want to have a look at some of these very specific devices that are being pushed out um, alongside Microsoft as well as the Surface. Okay. There is some new capabilities that are out there when it comes to Copilot. So this is the what's new to Copilot. Um, what I particularly like is that Copilot has been expanded to do team Copilot. So it's not just about the individual anymore. It's actually got a meeting facilitator. It's got a group collaborator and a project manager that is coming into play as part of these features and functionality. Then that way it allows you, you know, because you think about it, when you go into a meeting, you've got the, you know, what's the catch up kind of thing, which can be a little bit about you, but they're making it for everyone. What's the catch up? What's the action items for the meeting? Okay, so it's it's shifting the way that you might want to push it into your meeting because it's really been, I suppose, in the past, very focused on the individual. So some of that is actually um, changing. There's also agents so that you can do your custom co-pilots and extensions and connectors. So I will touch a little on that in a minute. Okay. There's a video, so you can actually play. It's pushed in there. It doesn't run for very long. It's kind of only, a, a, you know, a little over a minute or so. I won't play it now. Let's move forward. Go and have a look. Okay. Now, prompt like a pro. What we've actually got is the ability to be able to do channel highlights now with Copilot in Teams. So you can come in and ask it, for example, what's new in this channel of this team? Now, you're going to need to be specific when you actually put this prompt in. Otherwise, it might not search in the right channel. So you have to be fairly clear as to where you're going and what that actually looks like when you when you do put it in. So it's a new way to be able to, and there's more and more of the prompts that are coming out to help you. You can dive in deeper now on top of it. So once you've done that, you know, what's the update? It will then give you some auto-generated prompts that you can actually use to follow up and start to deep dive down in it, for example. So once it's gone from there, you can go, you know, um, you know, what's the what's the key points about that go-to-market campaign in the channel, for example. There's also um, a catch up on your channels then in one place. So you can actually do this now with one simple prompt. Now, whether you're in chat, so you've got your chat, you can do it in or you can do your, your main down in channels. So that way you don't have to go through dozens and dozens of threads. You can go to the main one and actually ask it as part of that, you know, the, the chat functionality over in Teams. 
You've also got the ability to leverage relevant documents now. So those documents means that they're actually graph grounded in your chat. So you might want to go catch up on um, and you can actually use, you know, content to be able to ground it, give me information from to be able to bring over into your Copilot chat. There is also a this here, this prompt like a pro is actually a new monthly newsletter that's actually coming out. You you can sign up for it so you can do a subscription and have that actually flow through to your mailbox. Okay. So what's also happening is there is the um, Grow with Copilot that's coming out. It is a, I suppose, another sort of newsletter subscription that you can come in. Um, there is a checklist that I particularly like that you can actually go through in terms of rolling out. There is training that's actually flowing through that you could go in if you wanted to have, have a look at the webinars that are being hosted around particular um, um, roles. So if you're a particular role, you can go and actually register on those as well as that prompt we're series that we've just talked about it. Now we've already talked about the check out the latest course as well. There is in there also referring back to the work trend index. So we're seeing it pop up and putting things in context for us. So, you know, 78% of small business. So this is actually a grow with Copilot focused on small business. So if you are in the small business space, the one that I like, they do a customer spotlight and it's got Marulia Health in there. So if you um, want to have a read of some good case studies, I suppose, go and have a look at what they're actually doing and how they're doing it. As well as that, in terms of some of the end users, it's got the technical capabilities, but of course I'm more focused on the end user capability. Some of those capabilities are the ability to be able to do your teamwork with Planner. So there are some other features and functionalities and it gives you that, you know, getting started, how do you manage your plan? How do you track your plans? So some of these features and functionalities all then now dropping into Planner. There's also some new prompts that have come in. Those prompt and the way that you can do your prompting in the suggestions is a drop down based on a role. So it's actually got those additional prompts in there um, that will be coming in based on roles and industries. There's more. There's only a couple at the moment, but they will be building it out because you can kind of see here it's only got sort of three and departments are sort of two, but they will have more and more as it goes. Okay. There's also the ability to now be able to do discover and have a catch up. So instead of just try these prompts, which you've got here, you've now got a catch up. So what are the prompts to be able to do catch up? Um, and then it has you know, information around it as a, as a bit of a catch up on important meetings. So it will tell you, you know, a little bit of a catch up of what you've done, where you're going and uh, information that's flown out. So there's all these different cards to be able, proactively be able to catch up on your action items and important updates. You can improve the way you're drafting and refining now in your Word document. So there's been some new features and functionality around the prompts to be able to refine, rewrite, paraphrase existing information, for example. So you can elaborate and extend on and enhance content with statistics off additional information. So go get information to be able to do a bit of a refine of what you've got in words rather than kind of having it sort of standalone or create from, I suppose. So you can now refine off off the back of other information. You can also now use Microsoft Loop. So there is Copilot inside Loop as a particular component to be able to support you building off ideas. So you can do your Loop components in either you know Teams or Outlook, or you've got your collaborative meeting notes to be able to then bring your Copilot in to create and work on the go with others and and use it to um, use it to help you build in Copilot. There's the ability to also in Copilot in your Microsoft Forms, it has a bit of a, you know, boosting of the response. So now what it'll do is it will help you by going, do you want to send out this email to build on the response rate so that it has all these proactive recommendations for following up things that you can actually do to follow up if it's noticing that the response rate's not great. So I do like some of this.
The other one is um, continuing, you know, in terms of your writing and editing, it will actually have an inspire me button and Copilot will start to give you suggestions of things to be able to rewrite questions, um, be able to make sure that you've got, you know, any information that you can actually need. You can just click on the Copilot button and, uh, you know, get it to help you out a little bit more. It is limited at the moment in forms. It hasn't actually gone into quizzes yet, but it will be coming soon. So I do like some of this functionality of, you know, add Copilot, clean it up, insert with, ask a question around what I might have as a response. In Microsoft Build, some of the announcements were um, creating custom co-pilots from SharePoint. So now what you can do is say you can grab your current content and go, I want to create a co-pilot based off this content. So it's actually grounded in your content. So you get that authority of maybe someone wants to ask a question of your HR in regards to your leave policy or forms, for example. So you can create a Copilot off the back of it, it's actually fairly easy to do. And then that way, it's your own subject matter expert based off your current content. So um, I'm really liking uh, this in particular. So you can build your own little custom copilots, and those copilots you can then drop into a team or elsewhere. Okay. Or SharePoint, of course. Um, prompting like a pro, uh, there is a newsletter that's actually come out of how you can stay on top of your chats, how you can stay on top of different information. There's some um, cool, I suppose, um, advice in regards to things that you can actually do around prompting and how you can do it. What are the prompts you can put in, how you can stay on top of it. There is a shift plug in now that can actually enable you to be able to query copilot around things that are, you know, open shifts, what are scheduling, when is my next one, when do I have time off. So it's an actual plug in that you can apply to Microsoft shifts for copilot. So that's a new piece that's coming out. Another one is in Viva Insights, the Copilot dashboard will be now be available for all Copilot customers. Um, you will, however, still have to have that, you know, Viva, you know, licenses is still required to be able to access your Copilot dashboard to be able to get the advanced features. So you have the sort of the standard features, but if you want more, you're going to need the, um, the if you need the advanced, you are going to have to have those licenses, a Viva and a Viva Insights license to be able to do it, to dive right into it. Um, I do love some of the some of the reporting that comes in the advanced license. It's actually really cool around the semantics, not just for the organization, but it starts to dive down into the individual to like the team and the department and it kind of punches right down and gives you more granular responses. Um, next one is Outlook Classic is actually getting your copilot. I have talked about this before. It is now in there. So you can come in, help to draft, have the tone, drafting with copilot. You can do your summary up the top right if you just want to do a summarization. It is now all pushed out into Classic. Um, I suppose, like all things, when it comes to the new Outlook, new Outlook has got some more some of the more advanced functionality, but the fact that it's now bought into Classic kind of means that organizations are a little less likely to get off the Classic to go to the new, but new does have a little bit more, okay, coming into it. Um, there is the ability to be able to do language selection as part of your co-pilot during the meeting. You can then come in, you know, what does it look like as part of the recording? What is the language selected? And moving forward, there is uh, up to 16 new languages too, by the way. I'll come to that soon. There are enhanced notifications for co-pilot for use without transcription. So this means that when you're coming in, it's going to then ensure the data is not saved post-meeting. It's this customizable private policy that you can add. So what you can do is they can dive into it with a URL to be able to go and see what the policy is around Copilot. So it's a notification that will actually pop up going, this is what it looks like, this is what will happen, um, this is what our policy is around it, and it's an internal URL, by the way, so you can create your own. The languages that are supported in Teams meetings when it comes to Copilot has actually been extended. So these are the new languages that have come in. It is currently in these languages. You will note English, US, it is not English, Australian. 
That I have seen create a few things in terms of Copilot and some of the searching and the queries, considering the way that we sometimes will spell things. Um, then the team has, there, there, there is a few things around the Australian English that does throw up against uh, Copilot, by the way, just so that you know. Um, the English United Kingdom is there, US, but not Australian. If you ask it to uh, convert things over to Australian, it goes very, very um, broad Australian ochre, you know, mate, and it's it's dreadful. It's <laughs> don't don't use it unless you literally want to go down um, where it, it says you know troops on the Barbie type thing. So it goes pretty hardcore um, out back, you know, taking the taking what we like taking the Mickey <laughs> out of our our culture okay another one use draft with copilot in word based on text lists or table selections so that means you can actually select it now and off the back of that draft and then start to add content based on that information so that's a new feature that i do particularly like what's new to teams okay so when we come into microsoft teams and you go into your chat the slash commands have now come into play now, I recently had it when I did the slash commands and I wasn't able to scroll up and down to see what the slash commands were. Uh, but the next time I came back in, it was fine. It was a little glitchy. However, cross fingers, uh, we won't see that moving forward. I, I know they tend to fix things up pretty fast. But if you're wanting to know what the slash commands actually are, I've put them here in a list for you if you can't see them. So you can go in and go, you know, query quickly, add a loop content, or maybe you want to set yourself to do do not disturb, for example. Okay. So there's some of that in chat. The new feature that's come in is the ability to be able to, with loop, use co-edit of coding blocks. So that's a new loop feature that's now dropping in through Teams coding. The meet now it has come into group chat. So up the very top, in the new teams, it was kind of there in classic, but not there in new. That has now um, flown through so that you can do a quick and formal huddle. There is the ability now as part of this, there's some new capabilities in terms of a step-by-step -step setup of channels um, through to archiving and hiding. We need to fix archiving. <laughs> <laughs> and hiding. So it will go, you know, what does that actually look like? It's a blog around channel creation to archival. Um, I do like it. It's got a, you know, a process because now that we've got archive has come into play, you get this little archive iconography against a channel and that's now available. A new feature is the ability to be able to share contact information to other people in chat. Now, this is not necessarily people who are even part of your chat. Okay, So they're not necessarily even part of your chat, but you can actually share someone's contact information. So from someone internally going, you really should have a chat with and drop it into the chat. So it's like the contact card dropping a contact card in. There is a new um, a default service for uploading files using drag and drop. Now, the way that you can do it, you've got the third party file management. So if you're using the likes of Dropbox, for example, so you can actually change over what the default is for uploading and or the drag and drop. So it doesn't necessarily always need to be, you know, OneDrive and SharePoint. They're the existing defaults, but you can change it. There's a new improved copy link experience as well, right across the whole of the suite, so that whatever you do in Teams or OneDrive or SharePoint now all looks the same, and you can customize your link settings and permissions. There is a you know the little link, um, uh, the cog link settings. So they're trying to make it so it's consistent no matter where you actually go. And there's more coming up in regards to links and what's happening there, especially on OneDrive, by the way. Um, we've got in here as well the ability to be able to, in terms of co-pilot, Teams meetings on a mobile phone. So it is now dropping in so that you can do it directly from your phone to do give me my details, give me my details, give me my recap. Okay. Now that's only for eligible meetings with the transcripts turned on. And of course, you have to have your license to be able to do it, but you can do it now directly from your mobile phone. 
The meeting recaps and artifacts now are going to be automatically shared in the chat after the meeting. So you don't necessarily have to ask it. It's doing it right at the end of the meeting and it will just drop it in so that you can actually view it. Of course, like all things, um, you need to have your Teams Premium or your Copilot license to be able to have this feature and functionality, but it will do things like, you know, um, highlight the number of speakers. It will bring in when people's, you know, if they've been name mentioned and it will actually give you a number against it, against so the generated information and when it was mentioned. So it's got things like um, recaps that will bring in your whiteboard. It'll bring in all of the content that you actually need as part of your recap. There is a new wardrobe options when it comes to your avatars. Things are a little bit more professional in attire. So it was a little on the casual, but now it's bringing in some improved features and functionality. If you've already built out your avatar, you might want to go back if you want to make some adjustments. In your stream, so whether you're over in uh, OneDrive or SharePoint, you can now trim your meeting recordings. When you trim them, it will also automatically update things like the transcript and your chapters as well if you start to trim. So it will, will do that for you. I do like some of this. Now, of course, you have to have the edit permissions to be able to do trimming. Um, you can't just, no one can just go and trim. You have to have permissions to be able to do that. There's been some updates to town halls and in those updates are the um, ability to be able to see things like your live reactions going on so that you can interact with your audience and they can actually do stuff like raising hands. Um, there is some advanced, you know, producer experience in terms of the, the queuing and sharing of content, um, scene support. So there's lots actually happening across this place when it comes to town halls. We had a lot of these features and functionality in our events, you know, when we used to have our live events. Now that it's town hall it takes a moment for them to start to build up so now that's actually flowing through there is the ability to now have the intelligent recap in channel meetings it was there when it came to the personal meeting so those you know that you might have um pushed out there from your outlook calendar for example or your calendar inside teams but it wasn't actually there and it was we had some issues in regards to it doing it in channel meetings so that is now uh, flowing through and it's got the up to 16 languages so we can have them coming through into the channel speaker notes and all sorts of things okay there is the new capabilities now around those who can manage, who can record, who can transcribe, being handed back to the meeting organisers so that they can actually define who can or can't record or turn on transcripts. So there is only three roles to choose from. This is all part of setting up that meeting as part of those kind of meeting options. It's only the co-organisers or organisers and or presenters. So if you have your business and everyone is automatically a presenter, then effectively anyone can really kick off the recording. Okay, So you could swap it and change it and make sure that it's only the organisers or co-organisers that can do that. I agree, Kate. Because like, <laughs> for ages there, you know, someone would kick off the meeting recording and it would then be sitting in their OneDrive because it came from Outlook and Outlook means it's in the personal space. So the personal space means it went into the OneDrives and it, there was all these sorts of things that became issues around it. So that's rolling out. Um, and available for those that have got premium license or co-pilot license catch. Okay. You can have it where as part of the new Teams premium features, you can disable screen sharing to prevent the leakage of information. So this includes things like screen sharing and whiteboards. Uh, the users can't start a whiteboard session, but they can actually view and interact. So it's not like it shuts it completely down. It just means that they can't actually, um, uh, you know, uh, have it where they can capture it and all sorts of things. Okay. There's some new features and functionalities around decorating your background, understanding how the generative AI comes in to kind of be able to clean up your background for it. What's it actually doing? So I do like the um, the, the generative AI backgrounds at work. And we're seeing AI flowing, you know, right through. A lot of people don't realise that um, they're even using AI a lot these days because they're in a meeting and they're not even considering the fact that when they change their backgrounds, they're starting to use AI. So they go, how are we using AI? And they go, no. 
I was like, well, actually, there's so many features and functionalities that you don't realize that you are using it. Okay, now designer has come into Teams chat. I'm really loving the fact that it's come in. So this means that as part of designer, you can start to build and actually collaborate and create using designer and pictures directly in chat in Teams. We're going to see designer flowing more and more through. We use it um, already in the likes of PowerPoint. So designer comes into play, you know, it plays around with your, your page that you might want to have. So designer's actually been in there for a while. We're seeing it starting to flow through in lots of other places, including a um, like a group post in our channels and designer coming into that soon too. Okay. You can now do your own custom emojis and reactions. So you can upload. Um, they are, are visible. IT can decide who has permissions to be able to do that, though, as a capability. So we can start to build and create our own. The Intelligent recap, this is for transcription only meetings. So even now, if you're not physically recording, like video recording, but you can turn on transcript, that means that it will include that now for your intelligent recap. Okay. So I do like the fact that it can be one or the other, because sometimes organizations are happy for one, but not the other. Um, however, if you're going to do it and you're doing it off the back of the transcription, the thing to take into consideration is you're not going to get certain timeline markers in this because you don't have the recording. Things like it's not going to be looking at who's joining or leaving, for example. It's not going to be able to generate chapters because they're all reliant on a recording. Okay. Coming into Teams is... There are these channel cards that are coming in. I haven't got a screenshot. I did a really deep dive hunt all over the place to see if I could actually find a screenshot for you. However, cross fingers once it's actually getting ready to go live, we'll get some of what those channel cards. So those little channel cards will come through that will actually then go um, running over kind of on the right hand side in Teams where it's got information and descriptions and things like that. Um, it will give you last activity, the name, membership information. So these little quick cards. Okay. Now, noise suppression for hidden channels. There's a few things coming through in regards to noise suppression. I've had some real issues in terms of some of the tenant switching, for example, or the hiding, or maybe you're you know, even leaving or archiving where sometimes you still actually had through when you had certain um, activity going on notifications. So they're trying to limit it down so that if you actually hide a channel, you're only going to receive if you get personal mentions or you've created tags, for example, and those tags in Hidden Channel, so someone actually physically at mentions you, then you'll get your activity. So all the rest will then um, not come through. Okay. So this is like the channel mentions, for example, or a whole of team. Okay. Some of the team enhancements, we're seeing it already flowing through where it's going to now show up in the, you know, you used to have just your little tiny one um, screen. It was whatever you were presenting. Now it actually will bring up video as well as some of the other interactive things like raising hands and participants when it comes to, you know, audio and video. So you've got some little buttons now that you can actually do through that little presenter window whilst you're screen sharing to be able to manage those actions. So you can mute and you can do all sorts of things there, by the way. Okay. The notify when available feature is now flowing through. We had this where uh, in um, Classic it was around. Uh, we can do a bit of mild stalking of our people that might be somewhere waiting for them to come online. <laughs> so in the moment they're free, it will give you um, you know, Beth is now free for you to be able to chat with, for example. So notify when available. There is closed captions flowing through to walkie-talkie. More often than not, if you're in a warehouse, and I've dealt with a lot of frontline worker type scenarios, um, being out there in terms of businesses, it can be really noisy out in the warehouse and they can't actually hear on the walkie-talkie. So now what's coming into play is the ability to have live captions so they can actually read what's going on. Um, I do like this. It's also a fabulous accessibility feature because sometimes a lot of warehouse type workers or those that are using walkie-talkie, English may not be their first language. So I'm finding that it's also a great accessibility feature. Don't forget that when it comes to real-time voice-to-text captions coming on in a variety of languages on their home screen. 
There is some new meeting options when it comes to admitting participants from the lobby who can actually do that. So all meetings are going to be configured moving forward by default to organise co-organisers and presenters. So that is the default. So attendees can't do the just automatically accept anymore. And organisers then have the option to be able to set what it is that they actually want to have. Is it organisers only or organisers and presenters to be able to let them in? That way it will be um, a little better when it comes to some of the, you know, double checking and making sure who is coming in is actually the right people rather than just anyone accepting and you go, hang on a second, who was that? All right, and are they part of the business? Um, Organisers can manage the access to meeting transcripts and recordings and AI recaps and co-pilot and all sorts of things when it comes to that particular meeting. So who can actually kick off and work with co-pilot? Because remember, we've got now not just the individual, we're getting that team component coming through in terms of co-pilot. So then this becomes important to go, well, who can kick it off so that we don't have a ton of information and recaps flowing through into our chat, for example. Now, attaching files from your Microsoft SharePoint site on the mobile app. Oh, hallelujah. I don't know how long I have been waiting and asking for this as an, as an MVP, because in our channels, for example, it would only look at information more often than not that was in OneDrive or on the actual device. But you couldn't pull information over from SharePoint. It was really frustrating considering your team's channels is off the back of SharePoint. So now, finally, when you actually click on the plus button and you go, I want to attach, and it gives you that paperclip to attach, you're going to find now what location that does include SharePoint. Okay. <laughs> I do like that one. Now, there's also the suppressing of notifications from mute chats because at one point there it was still all coming through in the new teams it wasn't actually abiding by the muting there was all sorts of things so um we're starting to then see some of the changes that are flowing through in terms of the personal feed they're going to suppress the at everyone mentions and reactions now so that's going to come out and you're actually going to see you know some of those some of those um, adjustments right across all of the different platforms. So when it's muted, it's going to change. There are some new file previews that are actually coming in when it comes to Microsoft Teams in the channel. So what it will do is it will give you a little um, uh, quick pane for what those files look like. We were seeing this flowing through in classic. It's now flowing through into new. Now, when you've got, you know, multiple images that are actually, uh, you know, attached, you can actually kind of move between them. Um, if the file is marked confidential, then the information is not going to actually be shown. Okay. So it's a kind of quick preview part. That way you're not having to open things if you go, well, that's not the file that I need. Uh, the presenter toolbar up the top coming really soon. Yay, this is another one I'm really loving, is the fact that you can actually drag that presenter toolbar around. There has been times where I'm needed to click up the top on something that's maximized on the screen. And every time you go towards the top of the screen, it gets in the way because I might want to sort of drag down a window or something like that, or um, the search bars up the top, but I can't type in there. So I'm really looking forward to the fact that I can actually drag it around. Um, it's going to be using minimum space. It will time out after four seconds. So you'll get that red badge showing the sharing status still going to kind of be there, clearly visible to be able to say we've got the ongoing, you know, sharing. I see someone's also liking that, We're seeing, you know, love hearts and yays. <laughs> I know. Uh, something else coming to Teams. There is some um, new, the workflow template so that can become easily discoverable. What's going to happen now is Teams is going to have these cards in terms of the workflow that are, have that kind of and a footer link to be able to help users directly access this as part of creation. So when you go in and create, it creates all these little workflow cards kind of thing as, as part of those workflow templates. Okay. So this here, it's been used based on a template. So it'll put it onto the card. 
Um, the managing your do not disturb presence when you are screen sharing. So allows users to disable the automatic DND status during screen sharing. Okay. Um, then, uh, you know, it comes down to uh, you will get them if it's a priority contact, but otherwise the do not disturb is then there. The asking to join a shared channel in the past, it actually used to be you don't have access when it came to a shared channel, whereas now it says you don't have access. However, it could be that you go, I want to join and it gives you this little, it gives a permission so and you can approve or deny that request to join. Okay, So channel owners can approve or deny so that anyone else can do the share of the channel and you can approve. Okay. The auto creation of Microsoft Loop workspaces. So this is actually coming into play when it comes to your recurring meetings, because sometimes we have lots of recurring meetings and um, those Loop components would come into play. But when you've got recurring meetings where there's lots actually going on, what Microsoft is actually looking at doing is create auto creating a workspace that they actually sit in so that it adding then files and information and it'll list it out based on your meeting for the week into the workspace. So it goes into this new collaborative way of working. Now, this is only where you've got three to 50 invitees in terms of your recurring meeting. So if your reoccurring meeting is only with two people, it is not going to do it. It needs to be three plus anything over 50. It's not going to do it because there's just too much going on. Okay. There's some new onboarding around Teams and channels. So now when you go in, you can go and it'll give you a recommendation around joining. So we'll go, this functionality is replacing um so when you create a team and you go, do you want to show all these channels for your members, uh, you can actually come in. You can, instead of you deciding, the user actually decides. They will automatically get general. You can do a, you know, recommended by the team owner, but the member can review the channel and opt in on those ones that are of interest, okay? So it will automatically give them general and everything after that. It will be in the, you know, see the channels. Do they want to actually join the channels? Microsoft Teams on your mobile phone, if you've actually got the audio conferencing subscription, they can do the, I want to move this over to a phone call. If they're having any problems, for example, they can then, if it's a, kind of the SIM enabled and there's no disruption, you can do the transfer over to mobile calls instead of just staying on um, your, uh, through your Wi-Fi type connection, I suppose, when it comes to a mobile phone. Now, this is a, a new piece. It's called SharePoint Embedded. It is actually a license where it's a pay-as-you-go license. Now, this means that you can actually embed lots of other, I suppose, enterprise apps into your SharePoint. So it will kind of give you a screen where you can plug in other apps. And it will give you things like maybe you want to drop in your loop. For example, you can put your loop into SharePoint as an embedded experience. So there are some that are, you know, designer and loop. These are sort of the ones that come, you know, pre-built, but there might be other independent software vendors that you've actually got out there so that you can embed in pay as you go though. Okay. Custom, custom experiences. New feature to SharePoint is in terms of your section backgrounds, you can now do adding in your image or a particular gradient color to your page section. So it's got this kind of nice new feature and functionality along with AI um, and a few other things to be able to personalize your own images. There are lots more settings like fill mode and overlay and the opacity that you might actually want when it comes to those section backgrounds for pages and views. Um, there's an Enhanced focal point settings to be able to fill to scale and all sorts of cool things. Go and have a look and a bit of a read as to what's coming around pages and news when it comes to sections. Section backgrounds. Okay. Uh, you've also got these new video pages that are actually coming into play. So you can create, you know, video news posts so you can navigate in. And as part of your stream app, you can then go and drop down and you can you know, drop in your video content. So a page that's about video content. Now, 
of course, your video is going to need to be stored on a SharePoint where you've actually got editing permissions to be able to do this. So if you're not seeing it, you're going to need to make sure you've got the video over and put it into a site where it's um, going to be able to be pulled from for your shop, for your site. If you're looking at that SharePoint Premium, there is a pay-as-you-go calculator. Um, it is quite comprehensive around, you know, what's the monthly, how are you going to use it, um, how many things are going to be in there per document. You can start to then kind of get a bit of an idea of the pricing of the pay-as-you-go if you're not too sure, you know, how much it might cost you. So there's a whole calculator to be able to support you on SharePoint Premium, by the way. There's a new start experience coming into play when it comes to SharePoint. Um, this means that you might need to do a little bit of an update, I suppose, to some of your training content. It's got a bit of a user-friendly approach around creating sites and pages. So that start experience, it will help you out a lot more to be able to refine and review and monitor and, and lots happening there on the start experience. There is the ability to, in the file, now the file viewer we have talked about before a little bit, um, but there's a lot more that's actually come around the file viewer. There is a the new toolbar and panes and collaboration features to be able to support more than 300 file types now when it comes to viewing non-office files across OneDrive and SharePoint. And so there's more and more coming there. There's the new banner web part. So apart from the sections and backgrounds of sections, there's a whole new banner web part that's coming in for pages and news. So on our pages and news here, um, they're no longer going to be able to remove the, the title area, okay, because it's no longer mandatory on a page, but it's going to be um, rebranded as the banner web part with those new layouts. Okay, so you can actually add one or more banners. Um, you can do it in different kind of columns and looks and feels as part of this. You've got different backgrounds and there's new layouts that have come into play like author and fade. So these are two new layouts that have come into play as well. Um, if you do remove that, you know, banner, users can actually fix it again so they can come back in to do the undo or choose a banner and, and then restore the title piece. So you can, if you've taken it out, you can come back in. Now, this one is, this one's an interesting one because the OneDrive for the web, and, you know, I've talked, when I do a lot of training, I talk about, you know, the links and understanding that kind of OneDrive is a sort of SharePoint in the back end. And it's quite a long and lengthy, so you'll see here kind of the long and lengthy URL when it came to OneDrive. What's actually happening is they're shortening that URL to the tenant kind of my SharePoint. So now it's not going to give you as much information as what it did before with these shorter URLs. URLs. Now, what's happening with that then is because it's actually swapping over to the um, uh, swapping over to this, it's not going to cause any issues around automation or scripts or anything like that. The URLs will still function. Old URLs will st still function as they used to. It's cut this kind of a redirect going on. There's also going to be an update to the main tenant. So we've got the, um, you know, the tenant, my SharePoint, you know, domain. It's going to be going over. So the new is going to go over to onedrive.cloud.microsoft. That will be coming. And that's happening right across the whole suite. You'll see it all swapping over to onedrive.cloud.microsoft. Okay. Your videos now have got a bit of an embed feature when it comes to stream directly into Outlook for Windows. So this is the new, it's online on the web and Outlook for Windows, the new version, not classic, to be able to play directly from Outlook. Okay. You can when you drop it in. So when you drop in, you can actually manage that particular link. So as part of the managing, you can go in and go, well, who is going to be able to edit or look at it or work with it? You've got link styles and if you want to embed or you want to actually um, um, do a link to it or embed it in, for example. So there's all these different features and functionality. It will come into Classic, but of course with the new features and functionality around new Outlook, it's a little easier for them to just drop it in there. 
In terms of stream, the new stream videos are going to actually take up less space because what would happen in the past was if you started editing the chapters and transcripts and captions and whenever you went in, it actually created all these previous versions. And when it created all these previous versions, it then started chewing up because they're such large files, that metadata change would actually then chew up more and more space in people's OneDrive. So now what's happening, it's going to stop doing that version history in stream. So the moment you start changing it, you're not going to be able to go back and get that version history anymore. So it's no longer going to create that file version history. So be warned. Okay. In terms of stream, some more interactivity analytics are coming into play. We saw a lot of this in, in stream classics. And now that is actually flowing through so that the owners can understand what's actually been most engaging. It'll show unique user views. It'll show interaction percentages and the average time that was actually been looked at. From there, okay, we've got some new suggestions in terms of your N365 content callouts for Microsoft Stream. It's got this whole interactivity piece. So it's going to bring up, you know, do you want to actually maybe add the PowerPoint deck or Word documents or you've talked about it, other reading material that you included in as part of Stream and you can drop that physically in as part of the call out for interactivity features inside stream liking some of this that's actually flowing through there is in microsoft loop when you're creating tasks now in loop the components will sync like it does for to do and planner and tasks it's actually going to flow from loop out into the various apps now so when you're going over in to do it'll go open this up in loop or if you're actually over in planner it's got the loop task list to lead you back into it again so i'm really liking that because we've got all these action items and things that are coming out of teams premium or you know with copilot all the things that are going you know recap and it was using loop as a component or we're using loop as a component in chat and channels but the task side of things wasn't actually flowing through so the fact that that's all now starting to come into play and that interconnectivity love it okay and i still love microsoft to do as my mana place of all things task management so the fact that it's now bringing in the loop stuff is um is such a bonus there's also the ability to have now third party integration with the likes of something like you know, Trello or Jira into your loop. So what you can do is go through this process where you drop it in. It gives you the do you want to proceed. So it starts to link them together. So you can drop in other, I suppose, it's a note taking slash interactive collaborative parts. Now, there are going to be limitations of what you can actually do with each of those integrations when you're bringing it into Loop. There's lots you can do, but there's going to be, you'll need to go and have a look at what it looks like for the, the, the challenges you might have having it dropped into Loop. But it's great because a workspace means that you can have one place to go where you can see everything, including stuff that you've got from other applications. So like it, one place to bring it all together. In terms of Planner, there is the ability to actually have now a baseline feature. So this means that you can actually capture a particular state of a plan at a certain moment. By having that baseline, it means that you can then have a look, are you actually on track and make adjustments as ne necessarily? So you can capture that state of the plan. So you can come in and start to go create your baseline right at the very beginning. Um, and then you can, you know, look at how you can leverage that but of course this is that kind of planner pro type feature so you need to have your project plan three and above for your users to be able to use it in the new planner app across teams to have that baseline functionality you can pre-fill in responses in regards to Microsoft Forms. So you can get that pre-filled. So if you know it's going out to a particular team with their information in and go get the pre-fill link. There's also now in terms of Microsoft Forms in the new um, in Outlook and the web, and it's looking at, you know, what does it look like in Outlook new to have the inline polling experience. So rather than a link going to the poll online, it will do it directly in line when it comes to web as you drop it in, as well as to see the results. So it's all in line to create and view and respond. 
In terms of Microsoft shifts, there are some changes that have actually come in now. So frontline managers can actually skip setup and start building. You know, there's shifts out of the box. There's some information in regards to how to deploy and manage shifts for your frontline teams. It's a step by step. So I do like the step by step and how it can actually be centrally managed as well. So new features around um, centrally managed by IT and frontline managers so that others can't override things in shifts, for example. So one to have a look at. In terms of Viva Engage, um, the results that are flowing through in workplace search. So this is workplace search. So if you're coming up and you're just on the, you know, the office.com and you do your search, the information that's now also flowing in is stuff that so that public, so the communities, the storylines and answers is all now flowing through onto office.com, sharepoint.com and Bing at work. So those results are starting to come in. I do like it. Okay. Now this one here. I've brought this into play because in terms of Viva Insights, and if you actually have a license to it, there's a whole new piece that's come into play around change management and a template around collaboration. So you can do some base analysis right through to what did that look like around shifting for things like, you know, collaboration time based on a particular group. Um, it looks at, uh, and this is just one of the, one of them, there's so many outputs that actually come as part of sort of managing the challenges that we get around a change event. So it gives you all these um, um, responsive analytics and insights to be able to support you of this change management template. Um, one I would recommend really going and having a look if you don't have an advanced license, I frankly think as a change uh, manager when it comes to your Viva Insights piece, I would highly recommend it because there's some fabulous stuff to be able to support us around groups and subgroups for you know qualitative and quantitative information, mainly qualitative for this because it's auto dropping in. Um, Microsoft now has, as part of the Viva Insights, Copilot assisted hours. So what it will do is it will give you an estimation of how much time did your organization save when it comes to Copilot based on what people are doing across the business. So you can physically then start to see what your ROI is based on what people are doing and where they are doing it when it comes to a particular action and how frequently they are doing it. So um, it'll give you a total hours saved. And then, you know, what have maybe people done um, to support that, for example. So, um, you know, you might be asked it, things like, um, are specific, it'll kind of give you an idea, are specific groups um, collaborating less with each other? If so, which ones are doing less and which ones are doing more? Um, is there an increase or decrease in collaborative behaviours for a particular individual, for example? Some great stuff that's actually in there, guys. Another one is the meeting cost and quality insights. So as you're using um, uh, your, uh, you know, Viva, if they're doing big, long meetings, how much is that actually costing you as a business? Um, we'll get um, nudges as well when organizing to say, you know, this is, you know, it costs, it costs the business to do all this stuff. So it's got all these meeting categories and habit cards inside Viva Insights so that you can actually see what's going on around meetings and the quality around meetings. Viva Connections has got coming through these first party dashboard cards. You can actually have it where you're dropping in cards for your news, people, events, praise, um, Viva, so you've got your learning, so learning that might actually need to be in there, pulse, approvals, shifts, assigning of tasks, Teams app, web links, and you can also create your own cards. So these are actionable um, tasks and information so that you can drop into your Viva connections. Now, this actually feeds into some of the new functionality because um, there's a whole new site coming into play. OneDrive cards is coming soon. It's not there yet, but having OneDrive file cards to be able to put them on your Viva con dash connections, it's not too far off, but they will be there. So you can see things like recently accessed or shared and your own Viva connections dashboard. So what's actually happening is 
the ability to be able to then pin the content. So you'll see here Viva cards that have been actually pinned then to the dashboard so you can customize um, and look at what content appears as part of a spotlight and you can edit, order, and um, manage those 11 pinned items as you put them into your Viva connections. So there's also coming up soon the Pulse card that you can drop in. So if you've got Viva Pulse, and you're doing surveys, for example, it will give you, you know, it has closed, it has opened to be able to drop onto the Viva Connections uh, site as well as part of those dashboards, what you want to push out in terms of stories, for example. You've also got it, and this is why all those connections and things have come into play, is because it's no longer just as part of Teams. It is coming through for your web component as well. So desktop and web and your news notifications. So with it flowing through, and we'll see a bit more in terms of available on the web in a minute, but the notifications that actually flow through, you can play around with those existing notifications so that the, the user can control what's going on so it's not so noisy. Um, and they'll see that in the sections as part of the Microsoft Teams um, notifications. So you'll see Viva Connections come up as part of their activity inside the settings inside Teams so they can play around, okay? So here it is, and now available on the web. It's not just in Teams, it is available. So you'll see here, this is our browser based. So we go to Edge, there's a whole web experience for an entry point for Viva Connections. They don't always have to go through Microsoft Teams and rely on Microsoft Teams to get in. So this then allows us to have all those customizations and cards. Like it? There's also some enhanced capabilities for spotlighting around Viva Connections. So you can go in and these are those 11 components. What does it look like in our spotlight sessions to be able to go, this is what I have pinned okay, and paired into your home sites, for example. Viva Glint, there is a, uh, a, a good... And it's not that long. You can see here I've done a screen clipping of it, of how to prepare your organization for AI. It's a whole insights piece when it comes to Viva Glenn because Viva Glenn has got an adoption pack to be able to help and support you around behaviors within the business and how you can tie it all together. New in Outlook. Okay, so there's some um, improvements coming in to tackle spam. The things that I particularly like that comes into play is it's automatically revealing the email address. It makes it much easier to see. You kind of go, oh, geez, I know that definitely can't be an email from Microsoft because it's got this, you know, it's, it's got someone's name and it's at a Gmail address, for example. So it's actually improving the ability to be able to see those junk email addresses. The other thing is when you go to visit a link, it will have a pop up to protect. And then on top of that, to be able to help and support you, um, there's the simultaneous report and block. So we'll actually have the two there. Which one do you want to do? Report or um, uh, block? Or do you want to also another one around unsubscribe? So there's two little pop-ups. The other one is high volume mail management. So that you can go delete all messages that are coming in when you go unsubscribe. So unsubscribe, get rid of them all as well. Delete. The new Outlook Lite. You've got the ability through there now to do SMS. These have been um, particularly valuable. Outlook has worked quite well with those that are frontline workers, for example, when they need to have a mailbox. So SMS is now coming into play so that you can actually activate and be able to push out. There's some changes in regards to Windows Mail and the calendars up around the new Outlook for Windows. So if you had the Mail app, it is actually swapping over to the new Outlook app, by the way. Now that's coming into play um, fairly soon, okay? We've got then changes in terms of the new Outlook, the windows, the toggle, you know, the toggle that we've actually got up the top, that's actually shifting that toggle. Not say, I can't say I'm a bit of a fan because it was kind of made it really easy to go, I want to convert back over. But what's happening now, it's actually going to be moved over into your backstage to the about, you know, Outlook page, and you're going to find it over in settings. Okay. Oh, yeah. I'm drawing it. Took a moment for it to catch up. <laughs> so that toggle is moved. Mm, it's kind of getting out now. A bit frustrating. 
there's in the new Outlook split view for the month view. It used to be there. If, um, it's actually already there, I should say, for day, week and uh, work week. But now it's coming in terms of a split view for the month. So you can display calendar side by side. There are two new search folders that are actually being supported for Windows on the web as well as the new Outlook. Um, and those ones are mail for specific people and the introduction of categorizing a categorized mail folder. So if you've got categories in place. So there are the two new search. There's um, other search functionalities as well, but they are the two new ones right now. Now, the link permissions when it comes to OneDrive for Outlook on an iOS. So when someone now inserts or copies and pastes a OneDrive link into an email, they'll be notified if the recipient of that email is going to be able to have access to it. Okay, so this is a new feature um, that's coming into play for iOS. It's already there for Android. So what's coming to Word? We have um, a merge formatting component coming into play that picture moved on me okay um when it what happens is when you copy and paste information and you bring it into word what was happening was it was kind of always keeping the uh, where the origination so where it actually came from whereas now it's going to do a merge of the formatting so it goes based on the document it's coming into it's been a long awaited for feature when it comes to how it actually brings information into word so it's swapping out of keeping the old and just going no no make it look like the new so i do like like that. If you want to, you can come back in if you like, and you can go into your Word features if you prefer it, and you can change it manually, but it will be done by default. Okay. So that's if you want to convert it back. So that's for those that are coming through in some of the newer versions and builds. So what's new to Excel? There was very little actually flowing through. Normally, this is a particularly busy one, um, but you can now filter based on comments um, that are active or resolved or ones that have actually been at mention. So this is new around filtering comments as part of that indicator that flows in. Another one is a new expression. So this new expression and the one that I particularly like was the reg extract where you can go, I just want to take the information that is to do with this part of a particular cell to be able to extract it. So a rather cool new one. In terms of PowerPoint, um, some of the uh, information that actually comes in for your files, it won't um, automatically fill when saving a file. So that title field, the file info, not automatically saved. Okay. There's also some changes coming around um, charts when you're, you know, linking in charts that aren't actually stored somewhere in particular, like SharePoint. So there's uh, some information around the source and where it's actually pointing to in terms of correspondings in URLs and preserving it, and especially when you're choosing something like a chart. Okay. Um, there's also an edit photo album in the slide sort of view. So slide sort of view, bottom right hand corner, if you go to the view tab, it's the one where you got the little four icon slide sort of view. Now, because in the past when you went edit photo album option, it was actually grayed out. That's actually changing. We're nearly done. Hey. Um, your caption videos in PowerPoint for the web is actually changing a little. So what's actually happened now? You can add in things like um, it will generate automatically and you can edit those captions for you. Now, this is only through the web. So it is an accessibility feature to be able to support you to be able to put in captions. Once you've got in, you can edit it, you can play around with it, you can add speaker names and descriptions and things that are going to be really important because automatic speech recognition isn't perfect, so we might want to adjust it. There is also the ability to have, and if you need to, additional languages. There's currently 76 supported languages that are out there. That way you can make captioning of your videos much easier for your audience if you're playing it. You know, sometimes we go on live and we're playing a pre-recorded or you're wanting to push it out there, or maybe it's even something that you're putting into um, onto a um, um, uh, sometimes we do like orientation days and it's got something that's just auto scrolling with captioning and information so that you can cover off accessibility. Okay. 
There's a whole up level in terms of note taking with loop components. So one note, yay, loop is now in your one note that syncs across. So you can copy and paste and bring it over in, take it in or out from one note. So any loop component is eligible to be into your one note and vice versa. It also includes things like at mentioning comments and reactions. Another one is the new sticky notes functionality that is flowing into OneNote to be able to help and support you. It is uh, available soon. It's kind of a in a um, um, it's been part of that insider experience that's now flow in. So it was there in the past. And why you might actually use it, I've included some of those scenarios of why you might actually use, um, as well as some tips and tricks and things. Now, it doesn't work with Dr. Desktop. So if you do use the Dr. Desktop feature, you're not going to be able to, um, it'll go gray out your sticky notes that will be coming soon. Something else is better tracking of annotations and scenarios. So if you insert or you've got a PDF that you drop into OneNote, and you start to annotate or do things, it kind of locks it so that if you move something around or you try and do something with it, then it will actually stay locked to whatever you've circled, whereas it didn't in the past. So that whole um, fix has come into play when you put in an image or PDFs or things like that. And I do like that one. That one in particular has been a big one for me because often I'll go circle, arrow, and I'll write a note. And then if I move down, things were starting to shift on the page. It was very frustrating. Okay. There's lots going on on the Insider blog. I'd recommend going and having a look. Um, I have talked about a lot of these features. There are some of them that aren't in there, but, you know, go and see what's new or what's coming. There is some retiring happening. Um, Viva Engage will no longer support iOS 15 or earlier. You must have 16 or over. Now, where this could be an issue is I often might see some frontline workers, um, those that uh, – even um, I've seen recently there were some truck drivers, for example, they've got a really old phone. It's not necessarily the latest version or they don't like updating in terms of the latest technology. It will be an issue for your Viva Engage environment if they're involved in social communities. Okay. And the other thing is users will no longer be able to go to the more filter to choose filters in missed applications in your activity feed in Teams. That's actually changing. There's more of an upfront filter pill, or, you know, around um, uh, mentions and a few other things. So there's some changes that are happening. You'll need to adjust screenshots once it's actually completely flowed over in terms of Microsoft Teams and how they can actually filter. Sway has, I mean, we're going to see Sway retire. It hasn't been updated since 2018. So that's like six years ago. So starting from June, you're not going to be able to upload video and audio files if you are using Sway. It will allow you to do links to, but it's not going to allow you to embed in anymore. So no more content actually saved or in there. Um, if you do have Sways in there, personally, I would recommend you can actually export them as Word documents, for example. You can export them as uh, PDFs as well. Well, so that you can keep your content and information and put it somewhere to be saved. Um, it will go. Okay. I think it's talking potentially, you know, end of end of year. There's lots of channel notes. Now, there wasn't um, a lot that was actually new in the channel notes. There was a few things around PowerPoint only. The rest was mainly fixes. Events and conferences. So next month, I'm actually going to give away a prize it is going to be to the value of $1,375, a ticket to the Digital Workplace Conference, which is going to be held in Sydney on the 31st of July to the 1st of August. I will be presenting at the conference. I'll be talking about how I successfully roll out adoption, how I use my wheel infographic, um, how I even created it or what I do, or how do I keep my knowledge up to date to keep you up to date. So I'll be talking about, you know, different ways that I actually work. So if you would like to come and join um, my session, that's going to be coming up, whether you win the prize or not. There is an AMA coming out very soon around security and governance for Copilot. Uh, it is a typed kind of one, not a video one. So you can go and have a look afterwards if you need to, if it's not a good in your time zone. There's a whole events catalogue that you can go and have a look at of what's actually going on over the next month or two. Some great stuff, community events all over the globe that you might want to join. Um, all the information, all my links are available in the presentation, um, as well as I've dropped in now the Copilot user group that's actually running out of Sydney, but you can join online. Previous content is there. So what's on next? 
On July the 2nd, I'm going to be having Rishi Nikolai come and speak around Mocha. So this is the modern collaboration architecture. Really looking forward to it. Um, he is the um, behavioral architect and specialist for Microsoft Global. And he has some fabulous content that he's going to be talking about when it comes to organization and their attention span and how the new extended Mocha includes um, Copilot. So one to come and see i've put in he absolutely is a star man i totally agree he's got some fabulous insights so really looking forward to him presenting next month um alongside of course getting a um getting a free ticket if you win now i put in the uh code here if you want to scan and join the next session or the link is there or if you're already part of meetup you can actually just go in i have pushed it out live this morning for you so you can join if there aren't any thoughts, comments, questions on all of the content I've just gone through, we've actually managed to finish just a little over, but a little earlier than previous months. <laughs> I'm saying it's taking around about two hours to get through the content. Now, so much content. And of course, there was a riot when I said, do you really want me to go through this or should I just stop it now and just do adoption only? <laughs> so if everyone's still rioting, then fine. I, I will continue to put it together every month. Um, the presentation is available for you. So don't forget, you can actually go online. You can actually get it from the link. The recording will go live on the Adoption YouTube channel. Please go and subscribe so that you can actually see when this recording goes live. You won't be able to click on the link in the um, in the chat. So I will try and take that at live for you as soon as possible. Plenty of content. Thank you yet again for coming along. And um, hopefully you've in, enjoyed the session and what's actually going on on love the cupcake workshop i know right two of them i did it two weekends in a row um they reckon i'm a sucker for punishment i think i am too <laughs> we did a breakfast first at my place and then and then it was about a four or five hour workshop on both sundays i gave up so it was pretty it was actually pretty hardcore but it was a lot of fun they did a good job so thanks jackie okay everyone until next month thank you for coming along